and welcome to Cup to Hook Bible Chats. My name is Cynthia with Cynthia's Joyful Creations, and today we are going to continue looking at the book of Galatians. We're going to look at chapter 3, and it is entitled The Christian, The Law, and Living by Faith. There are 29 verses in this chapter, and before we get started, let's just come before the Lord and just ask Him to be with us as we Listen and embrace the word and the message that he wants us to take away from this chapter. Father God, we just thank you so much for the opportunity to come together with one another and study your word, Lord. You tell us that when we study your word and we dig deep into it, that your word becomes alive in us. Father, our prayer is that when others look at us, they see you. When they look at us, they see the deep, intimate relationship we have with you. And Father, we can only hope that they would hunger to have that same kind of relationship. Lord, as Paul continues to talk to the Galatians, all the churches in Galatia, about the gospel and what the gospel truly is and not what the world sees it to be, Father, may we take that concept and may we hold it dear in our hearts, Lord, so that we too can know that the true, 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 true way to be saved is through your Son, Jesus Christ. That is the only way. There's nothing we can do, nothing we can say that can save us. Only the blood and the grace of your Son Father, help us to block out all, all outside distractions. I know the enemy will try everything possible to get in the way and interfere. But as we come together, Lord, we just ask that you will bless this time. For you say where two or more are gathered, you are here. So, Lord, we know that you are here with us. We love you and we ask all this in your name and your son's name. Amen. Okay, chapter 3, The Christian Law and Living by Faith. Before we actually get started, we're going to kind of do a little bit of an overview of this chapter because the biggest question that comes from this chapter is, should we obey or ignore Old Testament law? And the answer to that is, the answer to that question is not cut and dried. The law consisted of the commands that God gave Moses some 430 years after God established his covenant with Abraham. Paul points out that God had declared Abraham righteous before the law even existed. Therefore, Paul claims obeying the law could not be the basis for a relationship with God. Faith is the only basis of that relationship. The law was never intended to take the place of faith. It was never designed to give the people of Israel a list of rules by which they could earn their salvation. Rather, the law only served to show them how far short of God's standards they actually fell. The law exposed sin so people would be led to Christ as the only answer to sin. Paul called the law holy, spiritual, and good if one uses it properly. But if the law is used improperly as a way to try and earn salvation or to impress other people, it serves only to impose a curse. However, we should not ignore the Old Testament law. It shows what God considered important and much of it spells out timeless principles of right living. Parts of the law are still important, or excuse me, are still helpful for those who want to live holy lives. But Christians are not bound to fulfill the requirements of the Old Testament law to earn God's favor. Christians are to live a life of obedience to Jesus Christ and to the teachings of all scripture, both Old and New Testaments in view of the New Testament as an act of gratitude. So hopefully that kind of helps out a little bit. All right. 
we're going to start off looking at verses 1 through 5. You foolish Galatians. Now remember, this is the middle of this letter that he's writing to these Christians, to these churches in Galatia. So he's kind of done his little, you know, informal greeting or, you know, formal greeting or whatever. And he's now getting to the bulk of his letter. The whole reason he's really writing this. And he says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain? If really it was in vain. So again I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing what you heard? Clearly, Paul is a little bit upset. And he's questioning, did all that time that he spent with them, sharing the gospel with him, was it all for nothing? Was it all in vain? Because right now it, it looks that way. And when he calls them foolish I mean these strong words were well deserved I mean he spent a lot of time with them and when he left them he left with you know a great feeling that they understood the gospel for what it was and he left them feeling like they had these strong, personal, individual, intimate relationships with God. And that they understood that the only way to be saved was through Jesus Christ. But now he's looking at them and he's like, what, what are you doing? Who is deceiving you? Who has made you feel like that working through the flesh is the way to earn God's grace. So the strong words were well deserved, but Paul didn't mean that they were mentally or morally deficient. He just feels that they are failing to use the power of perception. Knowledge and understanding were there, they had that, but they weren't using it. He says, you have received the greatest gift ever, the gift of the Holy Spirit of God by faith. You have been deceived thinking spiritual growth is achieved through the works of the flesh. Has all of you, has all the suffering that you've gone through been in vain? He emphasized that there was a choice to be made. And so he's asking them, what will it be? Will it be faith or will it be works? You know, there is a scripture that says, faith without works is dead. But works without faith isn't faith. All right. Let's look at verses 6 through 14. And, and let me clarify, even though Paul is using strong words to them, he's trying to get their attention. You have to understand, he's not angry with them. He's concerned. He's compassionate about their, welf their welfare and their well-being. He loves them. And it's just like, a parent watching a child make mistake after mistake we want to kind of step in and make decisions for them so they don't make the mistakes but yet how will they learn Paul could have stayed in Galatia and never done another missionary travel anywhere else to share and spread the gospel but he loved them enough to set them free, just kind of like we do when our kids become of age. We have to set them free to make their own decisions, to become their own person. 
And just like God gives us a choice, we have to give them a choice. But when we see them going down the wrong path, we want so badly to fix it. And to a degree, as parents, because we never quit being parents, right? It is our job to make sure that they are being led down the right path. But all we can do is tell them. All we can do is give them advice and instruction. But then we have to step back. Because in the end, they get to make the choice. And watching them go down a wrong path, it hurts. It hurts because we love them. It hurts because we're compassionate about their well-being. Paul is no different here. He is talking to them out of love and concern, out of compassion. All right, let's look at verses 6 through 14. So also Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all those who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, as it is written. Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says, the person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. All right, Abraham was accounted as righteous because he believed God. Okay? It wasn't because of works or because he was circumcised, because the covenant of circumcision had not even been given at that point in time. We are righteous because of what Jesus did for us as we received it by faith. Abraham was made um, righteous by faith, not works. So this makes him the father of everyone who believes in God. The, uh, all nations will be blessed, is what God told him. Everyone who believes through faith will be saved. So if anyone who believes through faith, then they are saved. So God is saying, Abraham is your father. And he's telling Abraham, through you, through your righteousness, through you believing by faith and faith alone. And even then, they didn't have Jesus to walk among them at this point in time. So Abraham had nothing but his faith to believe that God was who he said he was. Um, he came to even believe in that faith even more when God asked him to sacrifice his son Isaac and then as he was going to faithfully do it, even though he loved his son dearly, Did God make him sacrifice his son? No. In the end, he allowed him to sacrifice a lamb. Because Abraham's faith in God was so real and so strong. If God put you to a test like that today, would you have that kind of faith to trust him? Well, if you do, that faith is what saves you from the curse the curse of this world all nations will be blessed for it is paying a price to rescue Jews and Gentiles will be redeemed 
But you see, Jesus didn't just rescue us from the curse. He paid a ransom for us. Because we were slaves to this world. We had a debt that we couldn't pay. So not only did he rescue us, but he paid the ransom so that we are now free. Now it doesn't mean we're not without sin. Oh, we still have sin. We sin every day. Sadly, some of us might be sinning right this moment. But we are free to make the choice to have the same kind of faith that Abraham had. And if we have that faith, then we truly are rescued. We are truly redeemed. We are saved. Um, in verse 8, it says, If the scripture say Gentiles would be saved, why did so many Jews have a problem with this? And the answer is, Jewish tradition taught that contact with Gentiles made one ceremonially unclean. Sharing a meal or entering a home of a Gentile was particularly forbidden. And such deep-seated views and steeped in tradition are often difficult to overcome. That's why everyone started acting so foolishly at that potluck dinner. Um, and Paul wasn't going to stand for it. He called them out for being hypocrites. And yes, that hurt, being betrayed by two of his best friends, might even be some of what's propelling him to be so compassionate towards these Christians. Again, do not confuse it as being angry with them as with being concerned. All right, let's look at the next set of verses. We are going to look at verses 15 through 22. He says, brothers and sisters. So he's talking to all Christians. Brothers and sisters. Not just the brothers, not just the men, but brothers and sisters. Let me take an example from everyday life. Again, you can just hear and feel the love and compassion that Paul has in this letter. Because he doesn't want to just tell them. He doesn't want to just remind them. He is still leading by example, even in a letter. And you can feel in this letter the longing he has to be physically there in front of them, looking at them, being with them, fellowshipping with them. But even though he's not, you can feel that compassion he has. Let me give you an everyday example. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to the seeds, plural, meaning many people, but, and to your seed, meaning one person, which is Christ. What I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years later, does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. That promise being Jesus will one day come and Jesus will one day walk the earth. That was a promise made to Abraham. And God is saying right here, or Paul, excuse me, saying right here that God is saying 
that you can't have one without the other. Because if you only have the law and the promise never comes, then the law is not going to hold up. But it says, for if the inheritance depends on the law and it no longer depends on the promise, but God in his grace gave it to Abraham with the promise. This is what I need you to live by right now. This is what I need you to model your life after if you want to try to live a holy life. But I am promising you that in the future, my son is coming. My son is going to walk this very earth. You will be able to physically touch him, physically talk to him, physically see him. And he gave that to Abraham. He told Abraham. Abraham was the first person who knew that his son was coming. Why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. A mediator, however, implies more than one party, and God is one. Is the law, therefore, opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But Scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin, so that what was promised, being given through faith in Christ Jesus, might be given to those who believe. God, get, God had to give us his standard law so that we wouldn't destroy ourselves before the Messiah came. We had to have something to model after. We had to have something that was physically teaching us right and wrong and holding us accountable. It doesn't mean that when Christ came, the day that the Messiah was born, that the law was no longer in effect. No, it's still there. And as we learn from the beginning on that overlook of the chapter, we still need that if we want to live a holy life. Honor thy mother and thy father. Do not covet what thy neighbor has. Only have, you know, a relationship with God. Don't put any other gods before him. I mean, we need all that still. But to truly be saved, to be truly cleansed and born again from our sins, freed from our sins, the sins we've committed, the sins we have yet to commit, in order to be freed from them, we have to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. We have to have the faith. We were in imprisonment before, Je before Jesus came. Before the Messiah was born, we were imprisoned. The bars of the cell were our sin. Scripture is what puts us in prison. Because Sorry, I wrote in a pink pen and I'm having a hard time reading my notes. Because it pointed out our sinful condition. The law can't help us because it's what puts us there. It's what puts us in imprisonment. Only faith can free us. Only 
faith can break us out of confinement. Only faith can remove those bars. You can be a good person and you can have a great heart. But my friends, I'm here to tell you through Paul, through scripture, through the Lord, that is not going to save you. If you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus, if God is not the ruler of your heart, outcome of your life is not going to be a pretty one. And Paul is just beside himself right now. He's watching his friends. He's watching his brothers and sisters in the Lord make horrible, horrible mistakes. And if he can't get through to them, then he pretty much has their blood on his hands. But you see, my friends, all Paul can do is plant the seeds. The rest is up to us. The rest is up to the Christians in Galatia. There's only so much he can do. Um, back when we talked about Jesus dying on the tree, Anyone who was killed on a tree was considered to be cursed. And it says, in what sense did Christ become a curse? And this is actually in verse 13. When God's law is broken, it imposes a curse, the judgment of God. When Christ died on the cross, a tree, not only was that the sign of someone who was cursed, but more than that, it was a sign that Christ received God's punishment for our sin. Somebody has to be punished for the sin that we commit. Whether it is us individually or through the Messiah, the Savior, who came and took that curse from us. He came and took God's punishment for our sins. If you want to look a little bit more um, on your own time, just for some more future study, more about those being cursed that die on a tree, read Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23. And that's where it talks about it um, a little bit more. All right. Then it says, what angels and mediator put the law into effect? Jews believe that angels gave the law to Moses. Okay. And there's a little bit more deep study on this as well in Acts chapter 7, verse 38 and verse 53. If you want to take a look at that. All right. Um, now let's look at verses... 23 through 29 and this takes us to the end of the chapter before the coming of this faith we were held in custody under the law locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed so the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. 
So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs to the promise. Okay. Before we lived our lives by faith, we were kept under guard by the law. Protective custody, is, as Paul has called it. We were then baptized in Christ, immersed in Christ. So we have now put on Christ. So in other words, when we become baptized, and remember, baptism does not save you. Baptism is just a public recognition that you believe in the Son of God and that you have a personal intimate relationship with Him. Okay? Because some people get confused thinking, oh, I've been baptized, so I'm saved. Baptism does not save you. Being a Jew or a Gentile does not save you. Being free or a slave does not save you. Being a man or a woman does not save you. Being a Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, Catholic does not save you. The only way to be saved is to have faith in Jesus Christ and that He came to this world to live among us, to experience everything that we do, to live in and among sin while yet still remaining perfect. He's the only one. He's the only one who's ever been perfect in physical form. And then die on a tree, a death of curse, and then and only then could we be free from the sin, the judgment from God for those sins. Verse 28. Has Christ erased ethnic, economic, and gender distinctions? No. Jews are still Jews. Gentiles are still Gentiles. Men and women are still men and women, respectively. What Christ abolished is discrimination for such differences. Unity in Christ transcends ethnic, social, and sexual distinctions. Everyone who comes to Christ must come the same way through faith and repentance that is beautiful in the eyes of God we are all equal we're not deserving of his love but he gives it to us deservingly and equally And yet, he loved us so much, even so much more than the compassion that you feel from Paul in this letter to Galatia. And he shows it to us by sending his only begotten son. And I apologize, I forgot to get a piece of pine straw so I can show you. But again, you have these three strands that run on a pine straw, and they're all bound together. So it's one piece of pine straw, even though it has three individual arms on it, so to speak. And that is exactly how God is. We have God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
They're all one in the same. God has been God forever. Long before the beginning of time. Jesus came down in physical form as God's son. And when he ascended back to heaven to be with God himself, he gave us the Holy Spirit to walk with us, to be our conscience, to be our guide, until we ourselves are in heaven with God. What a powerful chapter. What a beautiful chapter. Next week, we are going to look at Heirs and Slaves, Grace and Law. And again, what another beautiful, powerful chapter. Paul loves these people. He loves them dearly. And he wants to make sure that their relationship with God is right. Um, our verses today that we're highlighting um, is going to be chapter 3, verse 26. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. And then the last verse that we're going to highlight this week comes from verse 28. And it's the last half of the verse. So we're going to call it 28B. And it says, you are all one in Christ Jesus. You know, in God's eyes, sin is sin. It doesn't matter what the sin is. Some like to say, oh, well, you know, I don't do that sin, so I'm, I'm a better person. Sin is sin in God's eyes. He doesn't give it a measurement. You know, if you're going to sin, only do, you know, the sins at the bottom of the list or only do the sins at the top of the list because they're not as bad. In the eyes of God, sin is sin. So the things you need to ask yourself today and the next time you are talking with God, talk to him about it. Do you believe that God sent his son to die for you? Do you believe that God's judgment for your sins has been taken care of? Do you believe that Jesus paid that ransom for you? If you do not have a personal relationship with the Lord, in just a minute, there's going to be a prayer that you can pray asking God to come into your life. Do you believe that the things that you're doing are pleasing to God or are they sins that need to be forgiven? Yes, Christ came to rescue us, redeem us, and pay a ransom for us and for every sin that we've ever committed and the sins that we're going to commit in the future. But we still have to acknowledge that they are sins. We still have to acknowledge that they exist in our life. And we have to repent from them. And the way to repent is to ask God, please forgive me. I am so sorry, Lord, that I did that again. Or Lord, I am so sorry that I did that. But saying you're sorry and truly being sorry are two different things. You can recognize but until you confess it, and in confessing it, 
you try not to do it again. That's what being repentive is. That's what being redeemed means. Is that you try to learn from your mistakes so you don't repeat it. As Paul is asking these friends, these Christians in Galatia, to do some inner soul searching. We also this week need to do some inner soul searching and ask ourselves some very, very hard but important questions. And these questions come out of love, just like Paul has love for Galatia. God is asking you out of love these very questions. And he wants to always be the answer. God should always be our answer. We should always do things as though he is watching because he is. You know, they say, sing like nobody's watching, dance like nobody's watching. My friends, God is always watching. So let him always be your answer. Let him always be your guide. Let him always be your solution. And you have to have the faith that he is the answer. He is your guide, your father and your protector. And he is the solution for everything. I love you. I hope you have a great week. I hope you've enjoyed this study. I hope that it has been helpful and maybe has helped put your Christian walk and your faith into perspective. And if not, it's given you something to think about. But the ultimate question is, do you want to be rescued? Do you want to be redeemed? And if so, then let the Messiah, let Jesus Christ rescue you today. If you've already been rescued by him, if you have this relationship with him, but maybe it's not been quite what it should be. Maybe you've not let him be the answer and the solution every single time. There's also going to be a prayer that you can pray. Saying, God, I, I've not been where I need to be with you. I've not come and talked to you in a while. We've not spent some time together in quite some time. And it's me who's walked away. Lord, I know you've not walked away. Maybe you've tried to handle life on your own and you didn't seek God's counsel. Pray that prayer. Give him ultimate control in your life again. Because truly, the life he has for you is far better than the life we could possibly imagine through our own doing. In just a minute, I'm going to put um, all of our prayer requests up on the screen. If you have something you want us to pray about, leave it in the comments below and we will definitely pray for you. If it's something more personal that you want to just bring before me to pray for, you can send me an email. My email is located on the About page of my YouTube channel. And maybe there's something on your heart and you're not quite ready to openly express it. Just say, I have an unspoken. Because this is the thing, my friends. God already knows your heart. He knows your life. He knows every detail of your life. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what's going to happen. He knows how you're going to react. But when we come together and we pray for one another and lift each other up, that glorifies him. That shows that we know we need him. And we need each other. The gift of fellowship is a gift from him. He not only calls us together to hold each other accountable, but to pray each other up. Because individually and collectively as a whole, it shows that we can't do this world. We can't do this life without him. And without him, we are nothing but bonded slaves. Held together and imprisoned. 
but through him we are free and when he brings someone in your life that you can trust and you can pray openly and honestly and earnestly with that individual is a gift given to you by God your Father all right well here are your prayer requests for today and then we will end and close in prayer all right
Father God, thank you so much for your word today, Lord. Father, we can see the compassion that Paul has for his brothers and sisters in Galatia. The compassion that he has for us today. Lord, may we realize that it is faith in your Son that saves us. Not by the things we do or say. And the things we do and say should not be done to impress man, Lord. Everything we should do should be in glory of you and who you are. Father, we thank you so much that you sent your son, your only begotten son, to walk this earth. Father, where he also experienced being ostracized, made fun of, bullied, beaten, abused. Father, he experienced all of that. Because you love us. Father, thank you for the promise that you gave Abraham that one day you would send your son. Your son is the promise. The promise that has redeemed us, rescued us. Pay the ransom to spare us from your judgment. But in order to be spared, Father, we have to have faith and we have to repent. We have to say we're sorry. We have to ask for forgiveness. Lord, we thank you for that beautiful message. Lord, we have so many loved ones here that we want to present to you today, Lord. We lift them up in your name and we ask for healing. We ask for cleansing. We ask for you to touch their lives and their bodies, Lord, and heal them. Father, some are struggling with a need for a job. Some are struggling financially. Father, we just pray that you will provide for them. Father, some are struggling with relationships, whether it be in a marriage or whether it be, Father, in our relationship with you. And Father, we just ask that you would present yourself in a way that we can just feel you and know your presence is there. Father, relationships begin because there's some kind of connection. And we just pray that the relationships we have with each other, that that connection would be a visible and physical reminder that that love would grow strong and those relationships would blossom and flourish. Lord, we pray for this sickness, this COVID that has touched our nation. And Lord, we just ask you for healing. We ask that you help us get it under control. Father, so many are like, I'm so ready for our lives to go back to the way they were. But Father, everything that happens needs to be a lesson that keeps us from going back to the way things were. We need to take them and learn from them to propel us forward to live in a better way and in our better selves. And Father, that is my closing prayer, is that who we are today, when they meet ourselves tomorrow, it will be a better version of who we were today. Father God, we love you so much, and we thank you for this time that you have shared with us. Go with us throughout this week until we are able to come back again next week. And until then, we give you all the glory and praise, Lord. We ask all of this in your name and your precious son's name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me again for another wonderful chapter in the book of Galatians. I hope that you enjoyed this 
Next week, again, we'll come back and look at chapter 4, where it talks about heirs and slaves, grace and law. Until then, be joyful, everyone. Find your everyday joy. Let your joy tanks overflow. And I will see you again next week. Bye.